why would they not tell banks that they won't secure loans because they don't see the collateral they need or they don't why would they not do that? Yeah, it seems to me like if I if I were in charge of the government and I was securing loans as part of my job and you wanted to loan money and you were a private enterprise bank, but you wanted me to back up the loan. I want to see collateral and I want to know that the money you're loaning for this property is money that I I have every reason to expect I could get back if something goes wrong. I guess the question at the end of the day becomes more of a philosophical question. Uh, and I, I've got to get to four questions here, but at the end of the day, the question is, do you want the government involved in that process? Or do you want the private sector involved well, in that process? If they were involved and they enforced the regulations, I wouldn't be in this fix now. They're the ones that enforce a lot of those mandates that banks loan, make a lot of these loans that are not blown up. And now everybody in this room is on the hook for those loans. So a lot of those regulations that you're talking about cost all of us in this room a whole lot of money. So, yes, sir. With the draconian cuts that are soon to be approaching the defense department, mm -hmm. I know your name was an option. Right. What's your take on this massive, massive reduction uh, in the United States' capability to defend itself, particularly as dangerous as the world is? It's very frightening. And again, you know, I, I think it was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs came out in the last 48 or 72 hours and said that those cuts put our troops' lives in danger, and they are actually more likely to cause future conflict. Um, you know, our powerful military is what's caused a lot of our economic prosperity. Our powerful military is what's created a lot of uh, the, the, the peaceful times that we've seen over the course of the last 50 and 60 years. Um, what frustrates me about the cuts more than anything is the fact that they're not necessary. They don't have to happen. They're simply occurring because a bunch of freaking politicians in Washington, D.C. couldn't make the tough decisions necessary to prevent those cuts. I mean, they were given the option. Find cuts in the federal budget that you think you can make, or take a half a trillion dollars from the Pentagon. And the politicians can, from both parties couldn't come to an agreement, so they're cutting a half a trillion dollars from the Pentagon. I don't understand why our men and women in uniform, like I said, I'm an Navy reserve. I don't understand why our men and women in uniform are going to have to bear the brunt and the risk of the fact that politicians in Washington can't make tough decisions. Uh, I, I'm pretty certain that if those cuts follow through, we'll have the smallest Navy we've had since World War I. We'll have the smallest standing army we've had since World War II. We'll have the smallest strike fighter force we've ever fielded. And when you see uh, the Russian military as active as they are, when you see the Chinese military not only active, but growing quickly into a lot of new technologies, when you see things that are going on in Syria, when you see things going on in Iran, when you see all the stuff that's taking place, and the American military is wanting to cut a half a trillion dollars from the budget, I would argue there's probably a lot of other places in the federal government where that money can be found. And uh, so no, it, it, it's very frightening. Right? There was a report out this week uh, from the defense sector that talked about the fact that we might have to go back into cannibalizing our equipment. Cannibalizing our equipment is essentially, hey, the money's not there for all the equipment we need, all the pieces we need, the maintenance we need. So you know, if you've got 12 airplanes, you're going to have to cannibalize these two airplanes, taking stuff off of those airplanes to keep these 10 airplanes running. We're the United States of America. It's absolutely ridiculous. Yes, Constitutionally, that is the job of the federal government. Yes. That's the job. It should be. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's what I said earlier. You know, I think a lot of these things come down to what are the core functions of the federal government. I mean, the core function of the federal government, one of the core functions of the federal government is national defense. It's not making sure every single person, 100% of the population, owns a house. It's not a core function of the federal government. National defense is. And now the national defense is taking a huge hit. Men and women in the military are taking a huge hit. And uh, it, it's, when the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff comes out and says, this here is going to cause future conflict, that should be a siren to a lot of people because the military doesn't get out and make statements like that very often. Yes, sir. Um, there's three branches of government were supposed to be roughly equal, you know, balancing each other. But it seems like uh, the legislative branch has been kind of short shifted in in quite a while. I mean, it's been for quite a while. I mean, what do you think about that? I think we've got three branches of government, but this president is trying to create a fourth branch. I mean, I would argue we've got a regulatory branch now. 
between the czars and the bureaucracies. I mean, it, it is something that the American people deal with. Um, obviously, the three branches you're talking about, executive, legislative, judiciary. Um, I would say things ebb and flow. I think what people have to keep in mind is, you know, in all reality, the Republican Party right now really controls about one sixth of the federal government. We've got the Congress, or we've got the House. Democrats control the Senate. They control the White House, and you know, we can argue all day long who controls the judiciary. You know, hopefully that's not a very political thing, but you know, I think that question's out there as well. And uh, if we, you know, I, I was talking to people all the other day. If we didn't control the House right now, can you imagine what we'd be dealing with? I mean, can, can you really imagine what we'd be dealing with? I mean, some of the, some, you know, and, and not only what we would be dealing with, but if we controlled the Senate, you know, there's over 20 bills right now that the House has packed, bipartisan bills. You know, the president, you know, his budget gets shot down in a bipartisan manner. He can't get a single vote. Democrats or Republicans like go for it. Then we pass bills, Democrats or Republicans support, that are aimed at reforming the tax code, are aimed at lowering the budget, are aimed at job creation, are aimed at regulatory reform, and they die in the Senate. The Democrat controlled Senate. And people say, well, you know, why can't we get out of this economic malaise that we're in right now? Well, because there's not enough people in Washington, D.C. that want to get out of it. And that's a huge problem right now. We need to send more people to Washington that understand the way public policy affects business, that understand um, budgets, that understand spending, that understands taxation. We need more people that actually have faith in the private sector, that understand that the private sector is the driver of this economy, is the spark of this economy. It's not the government, you know. We were joking on the way down south the other day. It's like, everybody see the road construction that's popped up in the last six months? It must be election year, you know. That's not going to turn the economy around. What's going to turn around the economy is empowering the private sector, making sure that our national defense is strong, our transportation networks are strong, our education is strong, we're turning out the best and brightest. And when they graduate high school, when they graduate college, when they come back from the military, there's a job there for them. There's a job there for them in Southern Illinois so that you know, our mothers and, and, and fathers don't have to see their kid move to Texas or Utah to find a job. Why is our population shrinking? Why are we losing congressional seats? Because of poor public policy. That's why you know, I argue what's going on in Illinois is a perfect example of what's going to happen in Washington if we don't get this thing under control real fast. It's the same mentality. Sir, um, what are your um, I'm a student loan bill? Yeah. What are you, what's your feeling on that? You know, uh, I'm sorry, what was that last part? Where do you stand on the loan? You know, I think it's just like we were just talking about the other day. I think the Speaker of the House, John Boehner, I think he came out with a proposal just last week, um, for someone in the room, correct me, not your head, maybe no. But I think he came out with a proposal just last week to solve, to uh, uh, lay it out. He asked the Senate if they would take it up, and the Senate wouldn't take it up. And there's a reason why the Senate won't take it up. Well, they need that. Because, you know, they're trying to create this, this war on women, and they're trying to uh, create this war on the youth, and they're trying to create this war on seniors. And part of the war on youth is going to be this bill. You know, it's not going to be the fact that under this administration, youth unemployment has gone through the roof. It's not going to be the fact that kids graduating high school, kids graduating college, and kids coming back from the military can't find jobs. That's not the war on youth. The war on youth is, is, is this one piece of legislation that's going to solve all the problems. It's, it's really an intellectually shallow argument, you know, in my opinion. And I, I was telling people that, you know, you're, that, I personally believe that's one of those bright, shiny objects that you keep seeing the administration flow. Don't look at the jobs now. Don't look at unemployment. Don't look at taxes. Look at contraceptives. <laughs> look at the student loan bill, you know, and how, how big bad Republicans are. You know, don't look at the things that could get the kids back to work. Let's distract them with something else. I mean, the, the stuff that this administration talks about, and the stuff that Harry Reid and Nancy Pelosi want to talk about right now, I mean, can we get some serious people in Washington, D.C.? And that's what the American people everywhere say. It's, it's, it's quite embarrassing, actually. Yes, sir? Could you run a business uh, without having a budget for three years? I think the United States Senate does that. Um, well, you know, I'm, I'm kind of cynical. I, I come from a state that has a balanced budget in its constitution, and I couldn't tell you the last time I saw one of those. Was. Uh, look, another perfect example. The House, they present budgets. You know, the House presents budgets. Uh, the Senate, it's been over a 1,000 days since they presented a budget. 
uh, the Obama administration presents a budget that is so political, it's so absurd that they get in the U.S. House of Representatives zero votes. In the United States Senate, which they control, zero votes. It's breathtaking the lack of seriousness these people have. And, and you know, a lot of people like to say, you know, the Republican-controlled House, right? What about the years you guys controlled everything? Where were the budgets at? Where was the, the solution at? When you guys controlled everything, they weren't there then either. Now, the fact of the matter is we need serious people that are going to solve the serious problems we face. And I don't, I don't see them right now. I got one more for you. North Dakota has an unemployment rate of 3.3% or maybe less because all the transit into the world. They're using natural resources. Why can't they use in the rest of the country, really? Yeah, uh, right, uh, especially the, the natural gas fines that they've had up there, you know, and, and a lot of people would argue Southern Illinois is on the brink of that. We've got um, uh, the makeup, and we, we think we've got the reserves in the ground in Southern Illinois to emulate some of the things going on in Ohio and North Dakota, but unfortunately, uh, North Dakota is a little more aggressive in putting its people back to work, and I think that, you know, if Illinois was really serious, with a little bit of help from the federal legislators and with a little bit of help from the state legislators, we could go after those resources. And I can't guarantee a 3.3% unemployment rate, but I can guarantee an unemployment rate garden what we see today. And uh, not only that, not, not are people you know, just going to be working, but they're a great job. And coal miners, something like oh, that's a great job. Great quality of life. These jobs are out there, and the only thing that's keeping them from, from, from existing is this government. So, I got time for one more question if, if anybody has one. Yes, sir. How do we get our uh, partisanship to get back in the government? I mean, it's dead on, nothing's happened, nobody's working. I mean, we, like you said, we've lost all faith in the government all together. But how do, how do we change? How do we get it going? Well, I, I think Washington, D.C. is very polarized right now. But, you know, I think that there was also kind of a consistency in a lot of things I was saying tonight. Um, the bills that are sitting dead in the Senate right now because the Democrats in the Senate won't allow them to come to a vote, bipartisan bills. You know, in, in the Republican-controlled House, Democrats and Republicans voted together. You know, the budgets that we've seen, you know, it was bipartisan opposition to them. I mean, uh, it, it's clear to us that, you know, there are people willing to, to, to work together in Washington, but you have to have leadership. And, you know, I know we have a president that promised a post-partisan philosophy or whatever. But, I mean, this is one of the most partisan, one of, if not the most partisan administration we've seen in a long, long time. You know, and a perfect example of the, the, the nastiness of partisanship is going to be this election. You know, these guys, they, they don't have a candidate. And when they have a candidate, they wouldn't show up in debate me, but they follow me everywhere to, to take videos of them. Now, wouldn't you guys, as citizens and voters, be really happy to see two people up here talking about solutions instead of one person? You know, um, up in Illinois 13, right? What did the Republicans do when they had a resignation? They had town halls just like this in the counties where everyone that wanted to run for that seat they stood up here in front of the voters and they talked about the issues, they took questions. We're not seeing that right now. You have to have an open government, you have to have a transparent government, you have to have people that are willing to work across the aisles. And one of the most partisan things we are seeing, and this, this is a national thing, it's a national thing, but we just went through it in Illinois, it's a perfect example. Look what they did to the map. You know, look, look what they did to the map. You know, it's, it's not about what the voters want anymore, it's about what the politicians want. And in 2010, in Illinois, we, we elected five new Republican congressmen. And what, what did Mike Madigan and John Fullerton and, 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 and those folks do with the help of, of the folks in Washington, D.C.? They said, well, shoot, the voters elected a bunch of Republicans. Now we've got to figure out how to redraw the line so we can get Democrats in there. You know, so you have all of these districts, not just in Illinois, but across the entire country, that have been redrawn. They're super, super liberal districts or super, super conservative districts. And there's not a lot of districts in the middle. And you're going to have people come from those districts who are going to represent those ideologies. And you're not going to have a lot of people in the middle working on solving problems. So um, I, I think if you want serious people, you need to elect serious people. You know, you need to elect people that are honest. You need people that are going to, that are going to be open. So 
Um, last question right here, and then uh, we'll, we'll call it a day. Jesus, it's, it's, it's my opinion that we are pretty well ahead and we have great leadership qualities. When you take that costs me $20. When you, take, <laughs> when, you, when you take your seat, being a freshman, how are you going to be able to to bring about some of the things? How are you, how are you going to uh, uh, handle yourself? In order to have any any little bit of a say in this, well, I mean, there's there's a lot of good people, you know, that are elected to different positions. You take, I look what John Chipkins has done. I mean, I think people would argue that John Chipkins represents a district that used to be extremely democratic, and now it's a pretty Republican district. Uh, it didn't become super Republican because. Uh, People just woke up the next night and said, hey, I'm a Republican. It's because John Shippey's got out there and he voted with He worked with people. He worked with state legislators no matter what letter was next to me. He, you know, he worked with Jerry Costello on a lot of things. Scott Air Force things, you know. I mean, there's examples out there of people that have worked together. As a freshman, you know, I think it's important to Illinois 12 because we're in more dire straits here than a lot of other districts are. I mean, we really are. If you look at our unemployment and look at the problems we're facing, we're, we've got a lot of problems. Uh, it's important that as well that we have uh, an official that's in the Republican majority that can actually get things done. And um, the last thing that I would say is, you know, quite a few times tonight, I, I've said sincerely, it's not a Republican problem, it's not a Democrat problem, it's an American problem. Both parties are to blame for this. Or, you know, I mean, Social Security, you know, it wasn't solved when the Republicans controlled it. You know, same with medic. I mean, you gotta have people that understand. There's good people on both sides of the aisle. There's um, good ideas sometimes on both sides of the aisle, and you have to be able to say, you know what, I'm a Republican, but, but that's wrong. Uh, and you know what, that guy may come from the other aisle, but there's something to that, and we need to talk about that. You just don't see it today. I mean, you just don't see it today. I mean, you see these people that slash a half a trillion dollars from Medicare. And then they, they say, I'm going to harm Medicare. I mean, the dishonesty in politics, the, uh, the lack of sincerity in politics, and just the, the nastiness in politics today is what angers people, it's what frustrates people, it drives down voter turnout. It's what, when you see the polling data that says Congress is at 17%, Congress deserves to be at 17%. And it's not going to change until people believe in Congress. And you're not going to believe in Congress until you send serious people to Washington. And right now, I'd say that's one area where we lack serious people. So, uh, but I, as I said at the beginning, I think the selection cycle is, and every year they say it, it's the most elect, important election we've seen in a long time. It's, it's very important that we defeat the president. It's very important that Nancy Pelosi is not the Speaker of the House. It's very important that we take back the majority of the Senate. Uh, look at the direction these people want to take the country. And on November 6th, if people go to the polls based on that idea alone, do I want to know the directions Republicans want to take the country, or do I want to know the directions Nancy Pelosi and Barack Obama want to take the country? We're going to have a really good day. We're going to have a really good day. And if this is a serious election. The fact that you guys are here shows you realize how serious it is. And so I appreciate your sincerity. And I, I really do. I really do encourage you guys to get out there and, and don't be, you know, 30 people that go vote on November 6th and call it a day. Be 30 people who have asked a lot of very serious questions, a lot of very good questions, that talk to their neighbors and their friends at church and little league games, and wherever it is that you, you spend your time at work, whatever, the grocery store, uh, and talk to them about how important this election is and make sure that you, you contact all these people so that you're a huge force on election day. That, that's all that I can ask. Uh, at the end of the day, there's a lot of frustration here. There's a lot of the question about partisanship. You know, the number one way we change those things is we have an informed electorate. And I know that we're with the, the electorate on the issues. We're articulating the message they care about. We have a diagnosis of what's wrong. We have solutions on how to fix it. And if enough people know that and realize that, uh, we're going to get this thing turned around, but we're not going to do it without your help. So I appreciate y'all being here. And um, we appreciate y'all being here.